Good evening. Thanks again for watching my video. I'm continuing the topic of the Comet of 1811. I've already made two videos on this subject, one being the Comet of 1811 and the other the New Madrid Earthquake. And if you go watch those first, they'll give you some background information on the things I'm talking about today. Here is a screenshot of all of the viewers who have recently commented on my videos. I do appreciate my viewers, so thank you. I don't have very many of them, not yet anyway. And I'd like to make a correction in this video, because in my last video, I constantly mispronounced the name of Arkansas Professor, Professor Valencius. So forgive me for saying your name wrong. It was unintentional, and I'm sorry. Okay, very briefly, I'd like to recap about the Great Comet of 1811. So the Great Comet of 1811 was a comet that was visible to the naked eye for around 260 days, and it was a record set until Hale-Bopp in 1997. The Comet of 1811 was apparent from late March 1811 to mid-September 1811. So what is this video about? My intention is to investigate any links between the Comet of 1811 and historical worldwide disasters that happened at the same time, particularly the New Madrid earthquake, although today I'll be also be talking about continental Europe. So today I'll be looking into three different subtopics. The first is Calopin's Legacy, 1811, A Comet and a Quake. And this is actually the title of a separate video that somebody else made that I'm going to try to recap and discuss in my own video. And if you'd like to watch that, and I do recommend it, please see a link in the description below. The second subtopic I will be addressing is a medical condition about delusions of Napoleon's Comet. That sounds a little crazy. Just wait and I will explain it. So delusions associated with Napoleon's Comet. The third subtopic is the European continental disasters occurring in the same time frame as the Comet of 1811. To start with, I came across this video entitled Calopin's Legacy 1811, A Comet and a Quake. So first I'll mention a comet that was made on this particular video. I'm going to pause and then read this comment. And the comment reads, This verifies what my great-grandmother, born in 1873, taught me about the comets that struck the USA that her great-grandmother taught her about, because she was born in the year of the 1811 comet. It caused numerous strikes of objects in six states to hit USA and cause enormous ground shaking, quakes, fires, and even the Mississippi River course changing changes and bank alterations and overflowing. From New Orleans to Georgia to Washington DC to Montreal church bells rang and buildings shook and many collapsed. Well okay, um, some of that's information we already covered, but here's somebody who actually claims some ancestral lineage to the people who were involved in the New Madrid earthquake of 1811. Now that's a mythical account. That account would not stand up in court as evidence, but it's still great for my YouTube video. Okay, so the man, I'm getting to the video now. The man who made this video, which I encourage you to go watch, his name is Tony Hood, and he's from northern Mississippi, and this video is from April of 2011. So a special thank you goes out to Tony Hood for making this video. And it's a shame Tony's video does not have more views. I've come to learn that Tony has also written a book called Calopin's Legacy, and I'll mention that you can buy it on Amazon. Okay, so the way I've done this is I've written handwritten notes as I watched Tony Hood's YouTube video. So at 24 seconds, Tony is standing and filming inside a crater, and the crater's ridge surrounds him, and he suggests it's a 10 to 15 mile diameter. The surface he stands in is concave. Tony explains this is a crater from a meteor that hit the Earth in 1811 and caused the Great New Madrid earthquake. Myself, I have not confirmed the link between the 1811 comet and the New Madrid earthquake. That's why I'm actually making this video. Okay, at 101, um, there's some shots of boulders, big 500 to 1,000 pound boulders, and these boulders tend to be buried in the ground. And as Tony notes, there's signs of molten, um, molten rock that this was maybe has solidified from liquid and cooled down from the heat. At 209, there's discussion of inexplicable canyons that are 40 or 50 feet deep. 259, here's some shots of some molten or melded rocks. 
At 321, Tony notes that these rocks are found mostly on the northwest side of each crater. And that's interesting because it would indicate that something was hitting the Earth from above and based upon where these rocks landed on the other side of a, a crater that the earth was uh, that these meteors or comets or whatever they were whatever was hitting the earth was hitting the earth at an angle because the rocks associated with the craters are in specific specifically northwest cardinal points of the crater okay here's 322 a shot of the dog uh, 326 there's scattered rocks half buried again there's molten rocks 344 shows a collection of rocks that were amassed in this fellow's backyard, showing the rocks. 414, a little bit spongy, almost marrow-like inside. Those are my words, not his. And outside of this spongy layer, there's about an inch or inch and a, or about a half inch of a thick solid layer. Uh, 431, we see some weird fossil-shaped rocks. 546, there's iron deposits. 614, we've got hollow rocks. 628, we might have a bird's talon. 642, sad to look at, but a baby's leg. 653, a torso clasped by a human hand. And we see a finger. Number 740, at 740, excuse me, we see petrified wood. And uh, if we keep watching through the video, we'll see uh, pelvis, thigh bones, fingers, and toes, and more molten rock at 8 minutes and 43 seconds. Once again, please go check out the original video. Now, I'll be changing the subject. I'll be talking about how doctors of medicine, just your doctors, around 1811 and thereafter, were denouncing popular belief that the 1811 comet was linked to Napoleon's conquest and movement across continental Europe. I will even give this a heading on the screen. Delusions, Napoleon, and the Comet of 1811. So bear with me. I'm going to tell you how I came across this subject. So I was looking up books. I was looking up books on Google Books. More specifically, I was browsing books from 1811 to the 1850s on the subject of the 1811 Comet. In short, books written at this time are very pithy, meaning they're very verbose. They use a lot of words. They're hard to understand. Information is scattered amongst a lot of verbal diarrhea, pardon the crude term. In other words, these, are, these books are very frustrating and difficult to read. So I've tried to read them and resummarize them and represent them to you. Okay, so much of what is written on the Comet of 1811 seeks to give scientific description and explanation. And from what I've read, the 1811 comet was at low altitude, it had a small but distinct tail consisting of two rays, and this I can accept. Further, some analysis seeks to relate the comet's brightness to the interaction of the rays of the sun. Personally, I cannot understand much of this sciency type of writing, and I feel those I feel those who wrote about the comet did not fully understand the comet. My opinion is that the accounts about the 1811 comet are ridiculous and nonsense. Forgive me, because I know that sounds a little harsh, but that's actually what I believe. And I stand to be challenged, so try reading some of the source material provided in the description below, and you can challenge me on that if you don't feel that way. But now I'm arriving at my subheading. Had to give it some background explanation. And this again I call Delusions, Napoleon, and the Comet of 1811. Okay, so while I was reading Transactions of the Medical Society of the State of New York, 1849, a big massive book with smaller articles in it, I came across an article by a Dr. Joseph Bates from the Medical Society of the County of Columbia. Dr. Bates is talking about how people can suffer from delusions. Just broadly speaking, how people can suffer from delusions. And he explains how these can begin from early ages, where children believe in ghosts. And then he talks about how human emotion causes superstitions. And he seems to be favoring reason over superstitious belief like astrology. And again, he's writing in 1811, so maybe uh, the medical field was um, distancing itself from superstition and kind of going more reasoned and academic. Okay, on page 67, he begins to talk about the Comet of 1811. And because of Dr. Bates' wordiness, I find it impossible to sum up in my own words. So I'll just have to read you the quote. Much alarm and anxiety are frequently created by the phenomena of the heavenly bodies, such as the appearance of comets and falling meteors 
and so intense as to prove at least the exciting cause of various diseases. Many publications have been issued upon these phenomena calculated to heighten delusion and enkindle intense moral emotion. Wars, famine, pestilence, and death, they are regarded as being the legitimate harbingers. Within 18 years, a work has been published in England, the author of which traced so direct a connection between the motion of the Comet of 1811 and the military movements of Napoleon that he denounced all persons that denied to comets the character of special messengers from heaven as insulters of divine wisdom. Who can measure the extent of such mental delusion and limit its influence upon the human system in originating diseases, functional and organic? I don't know how you read this, but how I read this is that associating the 1811 comet with the destruction during the Napoleonic Wars is to be regarded as crazy. Rather, suggesting the comet of 1811 caused international destruction is crazy talk. Also frustrating is that Dr. Bates does not give a reference to the English author which links the 1811 comet with Napoleon. However, don't worry. I think I've found the author of which Dr. Bates is referring. He's talking about Milne's essay on the comet, which can be found on Google Books in a book entitled A Thenium or Spirit of the English Magazines on page 361. You can probably find it in other various academic works as well. That's not the only book you can find it in. In fact, the essay on the comet in this book is a condensed version. Maybe I better read that. Okay, so I'm just going to read a quote from Milne, David Milne, on page 360 of the book I just mentioned and well he uses these long run-on sentences but anyway but should the solar orb be obscured at midday by the interposition of the moon and the fair face of nature be shrouded in awful darkness should a splendid stream of mysterious light spread its arch across the sky should a fiery meteor rush through the heavens or a comet like the spirit of a desolate world shake far and wide its tremulous tresses terror and curiosity are at once excited to the full and we hear of the fall of princes the ruin of empires and the dissolution of the globe itself when one of these glorious strangers unexpectedly bursts upon the view and appears amidst the wilderness of stars with what different feelings is it contemplated. The gloomy ascetic will say it is the abode of the damned, others that it indicates the death of the illustrious and noble. The comet of 1811 was considered as the baleful star of Napoleon to forewarn the destruction of his armies, the burning of Moscow, also this celestial omen. The farmer scowls at the comet which parches his field, or, as it may happen, that drowns his crops, while the votary of Bacchus as he quaffs his wine blesses the comet which improves the vintage producing wines concentrated as its nucleus and brilliant as its tail but not only direful effects were said to attend the appearance of these bodies they were supposed to generate atmospherical changes affecting the production of the earth and the animal kingdom and this was the opinion as recently as during the appearance of the comet of 1811. It was noticed that the summer and autumn of 1811 were over the whole of Europe remarkable for long continued heat and the causes cause was generally ascribed to the great comet which appeared during the course of that year. Hence, connoisseurs in wines are still in the habit of distinguishing the claret made from the vintage of that year by the appellation of the comet wine, on account of the effect of this luminary was supposed to have had in maturing the vintage. Okay, whatever, you want to take, you want to talk about the comet lightly and talk about wine. I'm not impressed. Anyway, I would also like to add in the comment to my video that this essay by David Milne was actually from a contest an essay writing contest where there was a prize offered and Dr. David Milne AMFRSE apparently won because he delivered the best essay on comets and this was done at the University of Edinburgh in 1818. Anyway the point I wanted to make by mentioning the above Dr. Bates quote and then the Milne account is to say that in those times, 1811 and thereafter, associating the Comet of 1811 with Napoleon's military movement across Europe was regarded as delusional. I go further and suggest that this was done to denounce people who would make the association with Napoleon and the 1811 Comet.
or even further to suggest that some type of astral comet caused such destruction. This now brings me to the last sub-topic of my video, which is European continental disasters occurring in the same time frame as the Comet of 1811. I will now examine written accounts of the destruction and strange weather that was happening in Europe in the year 1811. For this, I will rely on a book called The Literary Panorama, Volume 10, and you will also find the link for this book in the de description down below. And particularly, I will be reading from pages 722 and 924. Now, if I were to read this verbatim from those books, that would probably take another half hour. So the way I've done this is I've actually recorded handwritten notes, and so bear with me, but it's more condensed than reading the entire account. Okay, so the literary panorama notes I've got here on page 722 and 721, actually. We've got an incident that occurred in Munich on August 26th. This is when, I guess, Olbers of Bremen discovered the comet in the air at 3 a.m. He had a sighting of the comet. And on August 31st in Berlin, a Professor Baden at uh, an, ob an observatory in Berlin uh, also notices the comet. And then, aside from this event, apparently two Frenchmen, Pons and Flogerges, you might remember those names from a previous video I made, predicted the reappearance of the comet in August. I'm just going to get right to the point and spoil what I'm going to say. You're going to notice, you're going to notice that August is a time of great destruction in Europe, with lots of fire and destruction and conflagration of towns. Okay, what do I have written down here? A mathematician, Mr. Page of Congleton, is saying that the comet that appears in this year of 1811 is actually the same one that appeared in 1661, 150 years earlier, and he also connects it to 1532. I'm just going from this uh, panorama book, what it says. I'm not picking and choosing what I talk about. Just almost covering what's in the book. What else is neat in this reported account, okay, they start giving scientific and detailed explanation as to the nature of the comet. I'm not going to regurgitate that here, but they do come to a comparison shortly after where they talk about Congreve's rockets. Congreve's rockets. And for this, I'm going to read in a very basic definition from Wikipedia, which talk of, talks about Congreve's rocket. The Congreve rocket was a British military weapon designed and developed by Sir William Congreve in 1804 based directly on Mysorean rockets. The Kingdom of Mysore in India used Mysorean rockets as a weapon against the British in the wars that they fought against the British East India Company. Lieutenant General Thomas de Sauguier, Colonel Commandant of the Royal Artillery in Woolwich, was influenced by the reports about their effectiveness and he undertook several unsuccessful experiments. Several Mysore rockets were sent to Woolwich for studying and reverse engineering following the second, third and fourth Mysore wars. Congreve's father was now the comptroller of the Royal Arsenal. Even so, Congreve had to start his project in 1804 with his own funds. The first demonstration of the solid fuel rockets was in September 1805. The rockets were used effectively during the Napoleonic Wars, the War of 1812, and the First Anglo-Burmese War of 1824-1826. Anyway, back to the panorama book that I'm reading from. Okay, on uh, the top of page 723, in related discussion, they're talking about volcanoes in the sea. Um, an Agincorp, Agincorp shi court ship, which is a British ship. I don't know if it's a fleet, but it's sailing in the Azores Isles. So Portugal, I guess, but that's way out in the middle of the ocean. And the Majesty's Sloop in particular is named Sabrina, and it's the island of St. Michael. And we're talking about a volcano in the middle of the sea. <clears throat> and I guess this ship's crew visit the volcano. There was an earthquake on the island on the August on August 14, 1811, and shocks uh, threw stones up in the air into the sea from the great crater. Uh, these crewmen from the Sabrina, which is the name of the sloop or ship, called the island Sabrina Island. It was a 50-foot tall volcano, raging and throwing out large quantities of stone, okay, and smoke. Along with rain, large quantities of fire, excuse me, large quantities of fine black sand covered the deck of the ship. 
So that's interesting. We've got fine black sand hailing from the air. Maybe that's similar to sulfurous vapor? I don't know. That's discussed in my previous New Madrid video. Okay, August 20th, 1811. The volcano, I guess, has increased in size. Now it's 150 feet high, one mile in length. And then, I don't know why this will be going back in time, but it says on July 4th, the volcano is perfectly quiet. Anyway, at some point along the journey, I'm not exactly clear, they actually set foot on the island. Literally, they walk on the island, and the ground and, and ashes were of a sulfurous matter. There's lots of dross and iron, and they couldn't stay on the ground on the volcano for very long because it was so hot. The basin of the crater was of boiling hot water, and apparently we learned that they put a Union Jack on the island to claim it for the Britannic Maj Majesty. They also mention in this article that this is Furnas. Interestingly, I have actually met a person who was from there. I believe it's called Las Furnas, and that's basically in the Azores volcanic islands. Okay, on page 725, this starts, this starts a separate article called Remarkable Fires Upon the Continent, Exceeding Anything of the Kind Within the Memory of Man. Wow. I mean, that's, that's quite a heading. And it starts with destruction and fires taking place on continental Europe. They reference this Anholt Mails, maybe that's a newspaper, on July 23rd in Bauken in Lus Lusatia. We have hot weather and a fire broke out and there was an eastern, wi eastern wind and 125 houses were destroyed within two hours. On August 20, on August 14th, excuse me, in Bohemia on the 1st of August at Premnitz in Seitz at 11 a.m. there was a, a house fire which started at a tanner's house and by 5 p.m., three quarters of the houses of the 368 houses in the town burnt. And that included a church, a vicarage, and the town archives. And the death toll was only nine, amazingly. Okay, July 29th at Salesfeld near Salzburg, Germany, 108 of 121 houses were destroyed and turned to ashes. Property and even harvest was destroyed. Makes me wonder if people went hungry. And now, kind of strange coincidence, the country of Hungary whatever Hungary was at that time. Towns in Hungary also were burnt. That's as much detail as it gives. Now there's an interesting detail here which says that a society of incendiaries were detected in Berlin at this time. What's an incendiary? Is that an arsonist? Somebody who sets fires? Anyway, it says uh, to go look at page 533 of this same book and it'll explain more. And it does. And we learned that there were some people apprehended in Berlin who were basically a society of incendiaries, whatever that is. And so I don't have it handy, so I can't read that into the video. Anyway, August 20th at Osterhoven, there was conflagration at 10 a.m. in the morning from an eastern wind. Eastern wind. Within a half an hour, a half an hour, 56 homes were reduced to ashes. And there was a harvest that was destroyed and a royal tax office was also destroyed. At Petersburg, August 14th, in Kiev, which I assume is just Kiev, a fri fire had progressed and flames built up so rapidly that the whole city was reduced to ashes. Doesn't give a whole lot of detail there, but it just says the whole city. Okay, August 12th, Konigsberg. Doesn't say there was destruction there, but it says that uh, temperatures were recorded at 40 degrees Celsius or 122 degrees Fahrenheit and apparently wax was melting, sealing wax. Okay, August 12th, Prussia. In Prussia, in Sadbrecken, there were burnt forests. Three quarters of the forests were destroyed. In Innsbruck, I don't know where that is, I haven't looked it up yet. On July the 31st, there was such extreme heat and then a drought that there was forest fires. On August 12th, in Semlin, in Vreden, um, at the department of Lalip, there was flames, and except for 14 houses, the whole place was destroyed, and water ran out at the foss, and it was impossible to stop the fires. August 31st, at Lisbon, I don't, don't completely understand what I read, but I'll just say it, a transport of 400 tons of copper bottoms took fire, conflagration happened in Lisbon, and it happened over four square miles, and three barrels of powder exploded. I don't know if that's gunpowder, but there's an explosion there. And there was crop destruction. And also it mentions in, in this article that in Poland there was a lot of burnt crops in Poland and crop destruction. Okay, the literary panorama. We're switching now over to pages 922, and the title of this article is called Phenomena of the Weather of the Continent, Extreme Heat, Extreme Cold, Dreadful fires and drought, conflagration. And I'm reminding myself to read a quote here. I'm going to read it because the first paragraph 
says it all. So the uncommon prevalence of extremely dry and hot weather on the continent has marked the summer of the present year with a greater number of extensive and dreadful conflagrations than was ever known. Whole cities are destroyed and forests, forests are consumed. At the same time, the effects of cold have been experienced prematurely in many places, and violent storms have committed great ravages. We have collected the following accounts of these interesting phenomena, which may be added to those given on page 725, and I already read that. Okay, so again, going back to my notes, in Tyrol, there were forests, and I have to look that up, but where that is, but there's 64 villages destroyed, 10,000 cattle Heads of cattle were killed. Rolamneg, seven miles of destruction, and there was apparently destruction at Innsbruck as well. In Silesia, Poland, and Russian Lithuania, there were burnt crops, fields of wheat, oats, oats and barley. Uh, meadows were withered, and brooks disappeared. Trees were despoiled. I think that means the leaves were dried up and died. And the ground was not workable, because I guess it was baked and hardened. That's what I gather. Okay. Uh, lightning reduced villages to ashes in Adrianople. And in Adrianople, one third of the crops were destroyed. Um, it kind of says, it was already mentioned earlier in the book, Kiev was entirely destroyed. Doesn't give a whole lot of detail, just says the whole place was destroyed. Hohenmauthen in Lower Styria, houses were burnt and baron baronial mansions were destroyed. And an interesting detail, flames were preventing access to the local well, I guess to put the fire out. I'm going to maybe say this wrong, but in Russia, in Pertitskov, P-E-R-T-Y-C-K-O-W, maybe I said it wrong, 662 houses were destroyed along with shops. But interestingly, it notes that silver was plundered. So not only was there a fire going on, but silver was plundered among many other things listed. I'm not going to read them all. It's a few of them are sugar, raisins, and like treasure chests, it says. Now, I, I got so overwhelmed trying to write all this down, because it's the same thing over and over, so I just started writing down the names of the cities. And it says a lot of the same type of things. But I will say the name of the cities. Munster, and I'm going to say these wrong. Vilshohofen in Lower Bavaria. Bartelsburg, Lebenbergen, Zurich, Franconia, Naples. Apples were roasted in Dusseldorf. And I looked up separately, Heisse gebratene Apfel. And it's not a popular tradition in Germany. People don't eat those. And this is about where my notes ended. So there's all these uh, fires and dry weather and heat. But strangely, there's about equally as many accounts of snow, of snow and cold weather. Snow in the middle of summer. In, Mer in Nuremberg, Memnefingen in Saxony, and Ban La Roche, there's snow. And there's a lot of accounts of snow happening and and crops having to be harvested early because of snow and frost. On August 3rd, in Lucerne, we have some accounts of overflowing of rivers in several parishes, and there's also instances of broken glass, and apparently lightning being the cause of this. Okay, well, that, that more or less concludes my video, and forgive me, I didn't, prepare the mu I didn't prepare much in the way of concluding remarks, but maybe that will lead me into the next video, because I probably will make more videos here. I'll just leave you with the question, what was going on in Europe in 1811, causing lots of destruction of cities, homes, towns, and hot weather, and cold weather, and snow, and fires? H have you ever experienced a year in your life where something like this has happened? What was going on?